So if we had somebody leaving a primary market wanting to come to the Midwest, it all comes down to the deal, the submarket. Um, but ignoring all of that, mm-hmm. if they said, guide us to any city that you uh, cover, where would you take them? I, Only one city. I can't, I can't choose a city. <laughs> um, so this is a biased answer. But I do think St. Louis gets overlooked. It goes back to what we initially talked about. There's a stigma. And I just talked to someone today about it. Kansas City seems to have lower cap rates. And I think because of that stigma, it's crazy how this industry is. There's so much perception that drives um, decision making. And because of the perception of St. Louis, I think a lot of groups won't go here. But the ones that do, do very well. And you look at Kansas City, you look at Indianapolis, Columbus, everyone knows those are hot markets. Everyone wants to be in those markets. I can't say the same for St. Louis. So for the ones that do, I think they're going to get very strong performing assets at a discounted price relative to the highly sought after Columbus, Kansas City, uh, Indianapolis. Uh, I also think the tertiary markets get overlooked a lot. We talk about how we hadn't seen the development in the St. Louis, Des Moines, Omaha. Well, imagine the Columbia, Missouri, Missouri, Springfield, tertiary, Illinois. There was very little development there. At one point in Q4 of last year, I want to say four Midwest tertiary markets were in the top 10 within rent growth because while everywhere else was filling up these apartment units that had just been built, and there's a trickle down effect from the primary markets to the secondary markets to the tertiary markets. These markets still remain very strong. Occupancy is still 98% in Columbia, Missouri. It's still 96% in Springfield, Missouri. While St. Louis had a 3% rent growth, Columbia had 7%. So it was a little behind, but mortgage rates are still the same in those markets. And it's not easier to buy a home there than St. Louis. So in theory, your renter class and your demand is going to be the same, but there's less supply. So we've been seeing really, really strong fundamentals in these tertiary Midwest markets that hadn't seen the supply come online. So let's say this hypothetical group says the tertiary market's too small. They want to come to St. Louis. If they want to buy class A or B product Mm -hmm. in a class A or B area, what can they expect in terms of maybe price per unit, cap rate, things like that today? I'd say price per unit's a byproduct of the rents. So it really just depends on where your rent's at. Are, are they? Let's start there. Like, let's say they're looking for class A product. Mm-hmm. What are we typically looking at per square foot in St. Louis? It depends on the area. If you're looking in Clayton, you're going to get north of three bucks a square foot. If you're going out to Chesterfield, you're upper twos, maybe threes. St. Charles, maybe 240 a square foot. So if we pick Chesterfield in that example, what are we potentially thinking? Cap rate per square foot, um, acquisition cost? Class A. Yeah. So, and, and the reason why I ask is because typically the Class A has, <clears throat> it's more of a coupon clipper. Mm-hmm. There's not that value add potential. Um, <clears throat> so what you're getting into is relatively going to be what you're getting out of it. And the reason why I said class A as well is because if we start to say class B, it becomes subjective. Like we talked about earlier with the expenses, what you're going to do, you know, maybe your game plan. Let's just say class A product. Yeah, I agreed. It's a good benchmark for where cap rates are. 570. So today I'd say 575. It depends on where interest rates are. And that's really been driving cap rates too. I I remember when rates were starting to move in 2022, people were optimistically thinking that because cap rates and interest rates historically weren't directly correlated, that they wouldn't move. Well, they did. And again, that's because of Fannie and Freddie really being the, the main provider for the liquidity on these acquisitions, 65 to 70% we're talking. <clears throat> if what they say goes, then that's <clears throat> where the the cap rates will, will relatively be. So if we're talking a 6% interest rate, 
Nobody wants negative leverage. We're hearing that term more than ever. We started hearing that term more than ever last year, but it seems like there's always a few groups that are willing to go in with negative leverage, meaning a cap rate lower than the borrowing rate with the idea that because of rent growth and because of the organic fundamentals that we have here, by the time that they exit, their cap rate is going to be above that that borrowing rate. And overall, they're looking at a five-year hold and saying, what are my cash returns? Do I hit my hurdles? So today I would say 575, give or take. It could be five and a half, it, it could be six, but it's really just a matter of where the rates are. And if the rents are, let's say two and a quarter a square foot, and let's call it this hypothetical properties, a thousand square feet a unit, 100 units. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are we looking at approximately per door? So that, those are bigger units. So that's, you're saying 2250. Yeah, yeah. There's 20, probably no class A product that's a uh, thousand square foot. It's a unit almost townhome product at yeah. that point. <laughs> this, um, I was trying to make it easy on you, but yeah, we can no, build it something else. I know, <laughs> yeah, the math. Um, no, you'd be looking north of 300 a door okay. easily. Mm-hmm. I think if there's a uh, Fifteen hundred a door, you'll be at maybe two twenty. Fifteen hundred a door in rents, mm-hmm. maybe two twenty five, two hundred twenty five thousand on per unit on a sale. Okay, so generally speaking, if you're buying Class A product in St. Louis today, and you're buying at you know call it a between a five and a half to a six cap, mm-hmm. you're going to be paying two hundred and fifty to three hundred and fifty dollars a square foot, probably. That's about right. Yeah. That's still very reasonable compared to well, any of those primary markets that we were alluding to before. No doubt. And <clears throat> and these sub markets where you're going to find the class A product are, I think, like you can't beat them. But uh, I'm sure other people may have other opinions, but they're great places. A hundred percent. They uh, they again, they have really strong fundamentals. And I think right now there's a lot of groups that are nobody wants to make a mistake in a volatile market, but it's good to see that with all of our transactions, it seems to be very credible groups at the top every time. It's, I don't want to call it dumb money, but there's just not the, that dumb money out there right now. Um, it's very sophisticated capital that's chasing strong fundamentals across the Midwest and blocking out the noise that maybe a lot of the skeptics are, are saying um, and hearing. So you stick to the fundamentals. Um, the, the assets are showing that they're performing really well in the Midwest. And I think overall the investments are going to be really strong, strong investments. And we've even heard that over the next 18 months, people may look back and think that now was the time to buy. Um, who knows, but it's interesting to hear and it's, I don't know. I feel like anytime someone guesses, it's probably going the other way, but hopefully that's the case. And it's just a little blip in the transaction velocity that we're in right now.